of you standing and we'll go right to our text for this morning if you have your bibles we're going to be in the new testament the gospel of saint luke a very uh, simple and familiar passage i invite you to turn there with me the gospel of saint luke the third chapter and it's just two verses verses 21 and 22 amen if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask that you turn there. Luke, the third chapter, verses 21 and 22. If you are in need of a Bible, we do have some Bibles available. We'd be in a bad place if we were a church and didn't have any Bibles available. <laughs> but we do have Bibles available. So again, a simple passage, a Father's Day message coming out of Luke, the third chapter, verses 21 and 22. Amen. If you have, if you're there, you're going to find these words. It says, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened. Verse 22 says, And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. A voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. A voice came from heaven and said, You are my beloved son. In you I am well pleased. Amen. I'm going to ask Jordan and Robert to come. They're going to uh, give us a uh, prayer before we go into the sermon but as they're coming I'm going to talk from the subject this Father's Day is your life pleasing to the Father Amen. is your life pleasing to the Father I have enough men here that means I have enough sons here who understand how it is how important it is as a son to please your father Amen. you follow what I'm saying Amen. so that's what we want to talk about this morning uh, and now we're going to allow these young men uh, to open our sermon in and with prayer amen uh, well because as sons we like to please our fathers when our fathers ask you to do a prayer 40 minutes before the service you just do it you don't you don't give much back talk so if we can just bow our heads real quick Lord uh, as we celebrate this Father's Day I just want to really encourage all the fathers on three things it's strength courage and also commitment uh, Lord we want our fathers to have strength not only to be the father and the man in the house but to be the father and the man in the world yeah. Lord the first step is in the house but the second step is among other people yeah. it's great when we come together and congregate on Sunday but we should also be doing that as fathers as men as people Monday through Saturday as well Amen. Lord I also want you to give the fathers the courage it takes courage to be a God-fearing Christian it takes courage to go out in the world and day after day do what you know needs to be done Amen. Lord, the word says, whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress, yeah. and his children shall have a safe refuge. Yeah. Lord, so we need, uh, we need the fathers to not only have the courage, but the commitment yes. to keep it up, to every day come home, Amen. to encourage their kids to be immersed in the word, to encourage their spouses to be immersed in the world, yeah. to encourage those around them to be immersed in the world, yeah. because without the men, it can't be done. Amen. Lord, you gave us you gave us Adam and you gave us Eve and all those who came after them Amen. need to be built in your image. So Lord, we come to you today asking for those three things. We ask that you cover and bless the fathers and we ask that you cover and bless everyone here today. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Yeah. 
uh, everybody bow their heads and I'm bringing a prayer for the sermon today. Uh, dear Lord, thank you for bringing us here today and thank you for uh, bringing us through the week. And Lord, we just want to praise you today and thank you for everything you've been doing for us. And we want to, sometimes we don't praise you enough, but today we will. Dear Lord, bring a sermon that heals the heart and brings comfort to one. And please, Lord, bring a sermon for everyone and also bring a sermon for me as well. Dear Lord, amen. I'm going to uh, beg your indulgence this morning. I'm going to ask that you remain standing for just a moment longer. Uh, for those of you who may or may not know, um, we are short uh, one man this Sunday. Our uh, brother Paul Williams is uh, currently in the hospital. Uh, if, uh, if you have not known, uh, he has literally been fighting for his life the last eight days. It was only on Friday that they moved him out of the intensive care unit to a regular room, but he is still in an uphill battle for his life. And so before we go any further, I would like to pray for him. Speaking with Barb on yesterday morning and being brought up to speed on all that's going on, not only with Paul, but also with Barbara herself and the family, uh, I said I would be sure to, uh, to offer a prayer uh, specifically for Paul. Uh, and also this week, um, our own uh, sister Rudy Williams, Mother Trainee's uh, uh, oldest daughter, uh, she too has been fighting for her life. Uh, in the hospital this week, uh, in intensive care this week. And so we just want to take a moment uh, and offer a specific prayer for them. Amen? Amen? I invite you to pray along with me. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed and holy is your Amen. name. Amen. We come to you because we have no other one we can go to. Amen. Thou alone are creator of the human frame and creator of all the known universe. Beyond creator, you're also the healer of the human body. There is no malady, no sickness, no disease. Anything that can come against the human body that you yourself are not able to heal. Amen. And so we exalt you this morning for being our healer. We exalt you this morning for being the source of all life. We exalt you this morning because you are our God. Your very son told us that when we pray, the saints pray, the believers, those that have been chosen by God, that when we pray, we ought to open our prayer by saying our Father, which art in heaven. And so this Sunday morning, we look to heaven. This Sunday morning, we turn our attention, our gaze toward the holy Mount of Zion, the place where God lives, the place where the Godhead dwells. And it is there that we make our requests known. Our brother Paul and our sister Rudy, we lift them up before you because only you can heal them. Only you are capable and qualified to raise them from their bed of affliction, to restore health and strength to their body, and revive their very life again. And so today we make it known our trust is in God. Not in hospitals, not in doctors, not in surgeons, not in specialists, but our hope is in God himself. And our trust is in your son who himself healed many, who himself raised himself from the dead demonstrating that he has all power. 
And so we ask in the name of your son, your beloved one, the only begotten of God, in the name of Jesus, that if it be your will, and if it was in the purview of your plan and purpose for the lives of this brother and sister, that you raise them up. Not for our joy, not for our celebration, but so that the power of God would be put on full display. And that all that I know them and are familiar with their situation and their circumstance could say without doubt, if it had not been for the Lord that was on their side none of this would have been possible none of this would have come to pass so we pray that prayer according to your word you said if we ask anything and not waver and not doubt and not be unsure but ask it of our father you promised you promised as only a father could to a son that you would honor and answer the request that we made known and so we make it known today father we make it known today here in your house where your spirit abides where your people fellowship and gather together again heal them raise them up restore life to their body their bones their joints their muscles and allow us to see their face again and so father as you do that for them we ask that you would do this for us give us faith in your word today give us confidence in the very words of our father help us to believe your word help us to receive your word and above all god help us to live by your word this is our prayer we ask him in the name of your son the lord jesus christ and all of god's people say amen amen, amen. amen. and amen again amen. come on if you believe god can do it come on give him a hand clap of praise come on if you believe god's a healer give him a hand clap of praise if you're here today as a witness that God has once upon a time raised you up, give God some kind of praise. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. If you believe God can do it, if you believe God will do it, if you believe he's able to do it, Yeah, we ought to praise God. We ought to praise God. It's Father's Day. How day long. Our Father, which art in heaven. Oh, my, 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 my. I believe my Father can do it. Oh, bless his name. Oh, bless his name, bless his name, bless his name. Yeah, my father can do it.
Oh, bless his name forever. You may be seated all over the church. I appreciate uh, Brother Robert and Brother Jordan for their introductory uh, prayers before we went into the sermon. Didn't know my son was going to put me on blast, but that happens from time to time. Robert Taylor Weich has been uh, a backbone and member of our Young Life Experience, our youth ministry, as well as our youth choir. Uh, he also serves today, as he has on other times, as uh, one of our youth pastor's aide, for which I am very appreciative. Uh, it is without a doubt, he is known in the church as Mr. Dependable. For you can ask him to do just about anything in the church, and he gets it done. Just a few weeks ago, he graduated from the High School of Engineering and Science. Uh, he has been employed uh, for well over a year uh, at the Chick-fil-A restaurant in Center City. Uh, this fall, he will be attending the Community College of Philadelphia, where he will be a pre-law student. And this is the one that I want everybody to hear uh, because today I'm not only preacher, I'm also prophet. He will also be the future owner and operator of his own Chick-fil-A <laughs> restaurant. Amen. <laughs> Y'all remember that one? Robert, you remember that one. Jordan Samuels Ford. I think we can all bear witness that uh, we have watched him uh, develop into an extraordinary drummer and percussionist. Yeah. He also has been a member of the Young Life Experience, our youth ministry, all his life. Uh, this recently, he graduated uh, from the Phoenixville Area High School with a 4.2 GPA. Yeah. He is also the recipient of five academic scholarships, totaling just under $10,000. He also has received a number of athletic awards for his participation in football. Uh, this fall, he will be attending uh, the University of Pennsylvania. And he will also be playing for uh, the Penn Quakers, who were 2017 Ivy League champions. Let's give both of these young guys a round of applause. Now, I believe, I believe, and I can say, and I believe that we can all say, of these two sons of Taylor, sons of this church, that of their life and their accomplishments today, we are well pleased. Amen. We are well pleased. I know as, a, as the natural father to Jordan, uh, and in many ways as the spiritual father for Robert, I know that I can say I am well pleased. The word Trinity, while a theological term, it is nowhere found in our Bibles. The Christian doctrine of the Trinity holds that God is one God, but he is made, he consists of three co-eternal persons or manifestations. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. 
said another way he is one God with three divine persons and while the word Trinity is not find in, found in our Bible in today's passage today's passage is uniquely Trinitarian Trinitarian in that we have all three persons of the Godhead individually displayed. Amen. We have the voice of God the Father. We have the human body of God the Son, Jesus Christ being baptized. And we have the visible representation of God the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove coming down out of heaven and resting on Jesus Christ can you imagine what kind of day this must have been the person overseeing the baptism the baptism of Jesus Christ was a gentleman by the name of John the Baptist and he picked up that name the Baptist because one of the hallmarks of his ministries is that as he called men and women throughout all of Galilee to repent and be saved because the kingdom of God was at hand. Amen. He would often culminate his preaching by baptizing in the Jordan River. Amen. This was a regular occurrence and unlike uh, preachers today that preach uh, uh, maybe, maybe once a week on Sunday, maybe once a week during uh, the during the week. John the John the Baptist preached every day, and anyone who was drawn or attracted by his preaching message, they would often hear and find John baptizing in the Jordan River. And on this particular day, like many other days, John the Baptist had preached. Yeah. And at the conclusion of his preaching, the writer in Luke causes us to understand in verse 21 that many people came not only to hear him preach, but to be baptized. And out of this crowd of people to be baptized, there was Jesus Christ. Amen. Verse 21 starts by saying, when all the people were baptized, helping us to understand that Jesus Christ was last in line. Everyone else had been baptized. Everyone else had been uh, immersed in the water and had come up baptized. Others had already been uh, confessed their sins and believed in this coming Messiah. This one who John preached would be able to save from their sins. And here is John the Baptist, weary from preaching, weary from baptizing. Here is John the Baptist standing knee deep in the cold waters of John. Here is John the Baptist, here wet, mud in his hands, sand between his toes and in his fingernails. Here John the Baptist probably looking for the end of the line so that he can go and get a fish sandwich and get a break. Amen. But before John could go, there comes one last person. And he comes and asks also to be baptized by John. Now if you look in the other Gospels, you will hear uh, the, the exchange of their conversation that they had because with the coming of Jesus, John began to perceive he was not like the other men he had baptized. And the Holy Spirit began to reveal to him that this was in fact the Messiah he preached. Amen. This was in fact the Savior that he made known through all Galilee that one day would come had now come and was now standing face to face with John in the Jordan. 
And other writers help us to understand that when John perceived who he was, he said, it is not right that I baptize you, but it is better that you baptize me. But Christ understanding the will of the Father tells John this. He says, suffer it to be so now. He said, yeah, we got to do it this way now. But there is coming a day, there is coming a time when in fact we will be baptized no longer by John the Baptist but by the Spirit of God himself. He said, suffer it to be so now. So all the other people were baptized. And then it said it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And what I like about this is that though he was in the crowd, and though John recognized him as being different from the crowd, nobody else did. Amen. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, Amen. wrapped in bodily flesh, was at church on Sunday, and nobody knew who he was. I got down here in my notes, nothing stood out about him. He looked like other Jewish men of his day. I wrote down here, he was an ordinary guy. For all of you guys wearing your jerseys, he was an average Joe. Watch me preach, an average Jesus. All right, I got a few laughs. I got a few laughs. That's my one and only joke for the day. So if you got it, you got it. If you didn't, you didn't. But what the point I want to extrapolate here is that he did not stand out. As a matter of fact, Isaiah tells us in chapter 53 that he had no form nor comeliness. And that when we should see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Unlike other great men in the Bible, the Bible uh, is on record uh, uh, for David uh, of how handsome. I mean, it made the point. David was a handsome man. Uh, the Bible is on record uh, for King Saul that King Saul stood above all other men. They acquitted him a head and shoulder taller than all the men in it. He stood out because he was tall. Uh, 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 unlike Samson who while did not look uh, uh, appear physically imposing when he displayed his strength it became very obvious he was not like other men. Amen. So the Bible uh, is on record for noting unique characteristics of the individual God uses but when it came to Jesus nothing stood out about him nothing would cause you to look at him and want to hang out with him I told you before he was just an ordinary guy just an average guy and I like that because so am I I don't stand head and shoulders above other men, nor am I on the cover of men's magazines for my countenance or my physical appearance. Just like many of you here today, we are all ordinary guys, but yet we serve an extraordinary God. But when this extraordinary God chose to bring his son into the world, he brought him in in an ordinary fashion. He did. Meaning that he was like you and I. Amen. He came common. He came equal so that we could see ourselves in him. Amen. Am I right about it? Amen. Here he is, he comes. John, after their exchange, baptizes him. 
verse 21 says that while he prayed and as John brought him up out of the waters the waters falling off the gaze of the Middle Eastern sun falling upon his, his countenance. The Bible causes us to note something unique happen. At the conclusion of verse 21, it says, the heaven opened. John had baptized on many occasions. Even on this day, he had baptized many others. But every time they came up out of the waters, nothing about the atmosphere changed. Amen. Nothing about the sun, nothing about the clouds, nothing about the sky overhead changed in any, ma any significant manner. Amen. But when he brought this ordinary guy up, when this guy who waited patiently at the end of the line, not preferring to be first, but comfortable being last when he brought him up. The Bible goes on records that says the heaven opened. Can you imagine Jesus coming up out of the Jordan and now seeing the heaven open and now being able to see again his father can you imagine John the Baptist bringing Jesus up and turning over his shoulder to now see the heavens open up can you imagine the men and women of Galilee standing on the shores looking at this ordinary guy get baptized and now see the heaven open up and I want to help you this is just not the clouds rolling away so that it could be more sunny this is not the sun shining brighter so that now you needed PS or PF 33 that's my second joke you missed that you missed that See, I tried to make it contemporary but whatever but whatever but they're all looking and what happened was the sky above rolled back revealing to the onlookers the perimeters of what you and I call outer space. Stars became visible. Distant planets became now accessible to the eyesight. Why? Because the heaven had opened. Oh my God, what is this? Who is this God? And not only that, not only did the parameters of space become accessible, but then the third heaven now came into view. The third heaven is where God lives. John the Revelator in describing where God lives says in Revelation 4 and 6 that uh, there is a sea of glass in front of the throne of God. Yeah separating him from all others who dwell in heaven. Touch your neighbor and say, open the heavens. Pastor, what is the significance of this occurrence? I give it to your church. Open heavens means open access. It was the father telling the son, you have direct Access to the Father. No heaven, no clouds, no suns, no planets, no stars, solar systems can ever keep me away from you. The Father was telling his son that whenever you need me, I've given you my beloved son. Heavens, he said, You have access to the 
us the Father. Look at somebody in the church and ask them, do you have access? My son, whenever he gets in trouble, whenever he gets in need, what he's got access to his father. Dad, this is where I am. Dad, this is what I need. Dad, I need you to fix this. Now, Dad, I need you to transfer the money now. He's able to do it because he has access to the father. Church, I want to know this Sunday morning, do you have access? To the Father. When you pray, are you praying under open heavens? Where you have unfettered access. And let me remind you, he was just an ordinary guy. I know when you're looking at it, and oftentimes we want to go to the pastor because we assume the pastor has access. But the access is not granted to an office, it's granted to the person who is able to believe that God is the Father. Ask your neighbor, say, Do you have access? Hey, we're almost finished. Verse 22 says this. Not only are the heavens open, but then the Spirit of God manifests itself. Coming down from that same third heaven, Luke tells us that there came a form of a dove. And that this dove was very similar to the guy in the water. This dove coming down was not your ordinary dove. Look at somebody say, not an ordinary dove. This dove was filled with the presence and power of the Spirit of God. So not only did this ordinary guy have access to the Father, he also had power from the Father. This is where I wish I had help in my church. John 1 12 says, but as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. As your neighbor, do you have power from on high? Is the over your life this ordinary guy not only had access to the father but he had power from his father as well and don't you know that God has power touch somebody in the church and say God's got power yeah, and that's why we prayed this morning because God's got power. That's why we come to church on Sundays. Why? Because God's got power. Power over life. Power over death. Power over sickness. Power over sin. Our Father has power. The sun is in the water. The spirit is coming down. And to complete the trinity, the father shows up. Amen. He shows up not in bodily form like the sun. He shows up not in a physical appearance like the dove. But he shows up the way he always shows up. Good God. He is so much God that when he decides to make a cameo appearance, he neither leaves nor moves from his throne up in heaven. But he prefers to send his voice because the voice of the Lord is like the sound of a mighty rushing wind. The voice 
grace of God in like the sound of tremendous thunder. Look at somebody and say, here comes the Father. And he shows up with his voice. Now, I don't know about you guys, but my wife loves the TV show, The Voice. All of the phenomenal singers get on stage and sing incredibly, melodiously, so much so they are given contracts, money, singing engagements. They show up singing the national anthem at the NBA championship. They show up singing the national anthem at significant public and governed government affairs. All because of their voice. How much so can you imagine the voice of God if we exalt these men, these women, for their voice, how much more are you and I to exalt God for his voice? For when his voice shows up, it's God in the fullness. When his voice shows up, it's God personified when the voice of the Lord Might I remind you that we serve a speaking God. The thing that made Israel's God unique among all the other gods in the world is that their God could speak. All the other gods were wood. They were statue. They were made out of stone. And throughout their entirety, they were silent. They never said anything. They never did anything. But when it came to Yahweh, the God of Israel, he introduces himself to all of humanity, not through the multiplicity of his attributes, but he in introduces himself to us by his voice. Genesis 1, 3 says these simple words, and God said. He didn't point, he didn't clap, he didn't storm. The, Moses said, he spoke. No thunder, no lightning, he simply spoke. Everything that you and I can access by our senses, what we see, hear, smell, touch and taste, was created by the voice of the Lord. Amen. Am I right about it? Amen. Somebody in the church say amen. amen. So here we go, we got this voice. So the voice shows up, thank you sir. And this is what I says. he says, the point I wanna make out the father's voice, and then we're gonna look at what he said, my beloved son, whom I am well pleased. Let's look at that statement and I want to work it because I want to say this. There are three important characteristics about a father's voice. I see it in my sons now. And I was even affected by it as a young boy myself. All the kids are out playing in the yard in the street doing whatever football basketball back in the day we played handball off the wall and whatever it was 
the day grows late and night's coming in and unlike mothers especially when, when it's dealing with their sons for a mother to get her son to come in oftentimes not always but oftentimes she's got to go get him you tell a son to come in on the basketball court he keeps hooping Tell your son, you tell your son, mom, hey, you got to come home. Mom said, we got to go home. They keep throwing touchdown passes. And then it forces mom to go crazy. And now she got to do something crazy. And look, and ruin the game for everybody. <laughs> because you were hard-headed and didn't come in. But did you ever realize this? He, dad, he comes home from work. He gets out of the old station wagon. <laughs> Ready to come in the house, maybe get a drink, maybe get some fruit, but most important, he's looking forward to sitting down. All day at work. Many of our fathers of that generation, not only did they work, they worked on their feet. They stood all day long. And they look forward to coming home and being able just sit down. <laughs> just have a moment, a respite in the day where nobody's calling, no one's asking, where I can just sit down and gather my thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe get a glass of iced tea or lemonade. If you grew up where I grew up, it wouldn't be iced tea or lemonade, it'd be Kool-Aid or Tang. <laughs> That's my third jerk in the sermon. <laughs> Trying to make it work for you. But oftentimes, as fathers, our desired pleasure is delayed. The last half an hour, mom has been calling for the boys to come home. And all to no avail. So mom has learned over the years, I'm not going to go crazy anymore like I used to. Mom say, I'm just going to wait until your father gets home. That's how, that's how I'm going to fix it. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to relay the message to your father. And oftentimes, mothers would peer out the kitchen window, assuming that like them, the father would head to the neighbor's house. And they looked for dad to come down the driveway and head to the hoop with all the boys and gather the boys and drag them back home. But mom would keep looking and she would never see dad in the driveway. She told him when he came in the house, she would check his chair. He's not sitting there. Maybe he's in the bathroom, maybe he's in the garage. But as she gazed out, she would then hear the father's voice. The father would stand not at the bottom of the driveway, but the top. He leaned on the old station wagon and he would call out the names of his son. Jordan, Jackson, Jacob, get in this house. And before you knew it, here come feet up the block. This one's running. Wait, I forgot my football. It goes back. This one comes around the other side of the cars. All of them running to get in the house. Why? Because there's something about the voice of a father. It's different than that of a mother. It's different than that of an older brother. It's different than that of an older sister. But when my father calls... I got to get up out of here. Many were the times I left in the middle of a football game, never waiting to end it, never waiting to get one more possession, all because I heard my father's voice. I got enough men in here. Am I right about it? Here it is. Three things I want to point out 
about the father's voice he says here thou art my beloved son I want to work that first phrase thou art my or mine a father's voice establishes connection Amen. the reasons why my sons respond to my voice is because we have an established connection other fathers go out and call their sons my boys keep playing my dad would call me I would keep playing and I kept playing because what that's not my dad's voice whoever that guy's calling I don't have any connection to them and because I don't have any connection to them their voice does not affect me one of the things a father's voice does is establish connection John 15 and 1 Jesus said I am the true vine and my father is the husband and this imagery helps Israel to understand that between Christ and the father there was a connection he goes on to tell Israel if you want to enjoy this connection you have to abide in me as the true vine as I stay connected to the father as the true husband yes. ask your name and say are you connected now art my then he says my beloved son a father's voice conveys love It's not motherly affection, but it is fatherly compassion. Amen. That when a son hears it, while on one hand he may fear his father, at the, on the very other hand he is drawn to the very same father. Amen. Because if that father has done his job properly, while his voice may be a voice of discipline it is also a voice of love Amen. so much so that a son knows no matter what I do I can always tell my father Amen. first thing I ask my boys when they tell me something heavy I'm like did you tell your mother and they be like no not yet different when you tell you when my dad because as a son there's the hope that my dad will understand what I'm talking about and that's what a father's voice does for a son it establishes that love connection and when as a son even though I may be wrong I can always tell my dad and that's a privilege that as sons we should all not only enjoy but take advantage of it why because as fathers we were all once sons know what it's like to be you 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 so I can always tell my dad why because I am beloved of my father Romans 8 38 says this he said I'm persuaded neither life death angels principalities powers things to come things not yet present nor height nor depth he said any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God Amen. that's what a son has to know about his father Amen. such that when he hears the father's voice there's a special connection lastly the third point he lives he says thou art my beloved son he says these whole words here's the sermon in whom I am well pleased Amen. that's what the father says not just come in not just clean up not just pick up but the father makes sure that
that at some point in their son's life they hear his voice they understand that they are connected one to another a father makes sure that a son knows he is loved not only by his mother but by his father too why does he do this because there's coming a time when a father must tell his son after sitting back and watching months and years go by at some point a father must say when I look at you my son I am well pleased I'm pleased with how you've conducted yourself I'm pleased with the way you've grown and matured early on in your life my voice was often a voice of discipline not because I did not love you but because I did love you and I needed to use my voice to correct you I needed to use my voice to get you walking on a better path so that when the time was right I could come to you as a father and tell you how pleased I am with you as my son a father's voice provides confidence and courage to a son as boys we love our moms moms grandmoms we love our mothers but every son longs to hear their father say well done everyone else can praise you for what you've done oh my god you were great on that touch oh my god you were like michael jordan out there and all that and they go on and on and on and the boy will keep walking everyone pray slapping him on the head everybody high five him chest all down all to get to where his father is because none of it matters until his father say you played a good game today yeah that now that was a good game then he said what a sigh of relief why because my father has given me the confidence and the courage I need to continue forward in my life's journey if you pair over into verse 23 I'm going to stop I'm out of time verse 23 helps us to understand that this occasion took place at the inauguration of Jesus's public preaching ministry Jesus said for for 17 years I haven't said anything for 17 years all I've done was obey my father and my mother but now I'm getting ready to step into what God has called me to do now it's time for me to come from out of the shadows into the limelight of his love and the father realized before his son could do that and even though he was part of the Godhead the son of God and even though he was quote equal with God and with God the spirit the son needed to hear his father say I am well pleased with you and you read it 23 he starts his preaching ministry he goes into the wilderness fast 40 days 40 nights and what were the last words he heard I am well pleased I'm sure throughout those 40 days there were many days he wanted to quit as most men often do I'm sure out of those 40 days there were many nights he felt like going back home to Nazareth but I believe that he just remembered what his father said in you I 
him well pleased. I'm going to say this and I'm going to quit. When God says he's pleased, he's pleased not only with what you have done. Yeah. He's pleased with what you are doing. And because he's God and omniscient, it's a sign that he will also be pleased by what you will do. When I tell my son I'm well pleased, I'm well pleased with what he did last night. Just like I'm well pleased with what he did last night, I could be mad at him tomorrow. Because what? He could do something tomorrow that what? Displeases me. But when God says... I'm well pleased. That means God has looked into the heart of his son and has determined the measure of his steps. I know my son will continue to please me. And that's the testimony of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. John 8, 39, 34, somewhere around there. He says, all I do is please my father shall we all stand I want to close where I started and I started by asking this question to the church is the father pleased with your life not your natural father not pop pop, not grandpa, not big daddy or small daddy, but is the Father, capital T, capital F, the person in the Godhead, is the Father pleased with you? Father's Day come and we set aside this day as we should to honor our fathers dad you get a day off dad I'm taking you out dad we're going fishing to dad dad we're going to get sneaks we're doing it to dad 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 today dad dad it today dad it's your day and all day today I am going to focus myself on pleasing you. Why? Because it's Father's Day. Today's your day. Relax. Kick back. Today we're going to celebrate you. And like I say, we do it rightly. We should do it. But when it comes to the Father, yeah. not your earthly Father, but your heavenly Father, if you get this, you got the whole sermon. Every day, it's Father's Day. Every day we should be committed to, looking to, trying to please the Father. Not just for a day, not for a week, not for a month, but every day we live, we should be set on pleasing the Father. Amen. Pastor, good sermon, good message. I missed the majority of the jokes, but I got one. You asked me a question, Pastor. Let me ask you a question. How do I please the Father? I know how to please my dad. I know what my dad likes. My dad's a simple guy. He's an old country boy. Fishing. Barbecuing. Sitting back eating watermelon. Those are the things that please my father. And I know them. Why? Because I'm connected to him. I've been able to see it all throughout my life. But how do we please the father? Who unlike my dad, I can't see. Who unlike my dad, I don't know. Pastor, how do we please the father? Three ways you please the Father and we're out of here. The first thing you got to understand that when it comes to pleasing the Father, the Bible tells us that without faith, 
it is impossible to please God. And pastor, if I have faith, well, who do I have faith in? You must have faith in the Son. That's what you got to do. If you want to please the Father, the very first step is you must accept and believe in His Son who He sent for the remission of your sins. Yes. If you want to please the Father, that's what you got to do. Secondly, not only do you got to have faith in the Son, you have to live according to God's Word. Amen. And you got to do that by faith as well. You got to believe in the Son. You have to walk in and according to His Word. Each of them by faith. And then last and most important of all, if you want to please the Father, you have to love like the Son. Amen. That's how you please the Father. First you have to accept and believe in His Son. Then you got to live according to His Word, yes. a.k.a. the Bible, the B-I-B-L-E. And last and most importantly, you have to love like the son. Amen. Well, how did the son love? His son gave his life for you, for me. God. That's how you love like the son. You love like the son when you're willing to die. Not only for those connected to you, but when you love like the son, you die for guys that are not connected to you. When Jesus died for me, we had no connection. Sin stood as a roadblock. Unlike Jesus, I didn't have access to open heavens. Unlike Jesus, I didn't have the dove flying over my life. But yet, the son died. Giving me an example to follow. So one day I could ask, what do I have to do to please the father? Just live like the sun. It wouldn't be Father's Day if we didn't have an opportunity this Sunday morning to invite anyone who is not a son to become a son. Amen. Today he goes from being the father to your father. Today he goes from being a father to my father. If you're here this Sunday, while the ministers come, if you're here and you've never 